Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, the first talk of this uh, last session of the day is by Daniel Dadouche on the smooth analysis of the simplex. All right, thank you very much. So this is a uh, joint work with my uh, student, uh, Sophie Harper. And uh, I guess the, the, the point of this is to try and have a, a somewhat simpler um, uh, and now smooth analysis of the, the simplex method, which probably many of you know, uh, at least historically, has been quite complicated. Um, so, uh, so that we're all on the same page, we're interested in solving uh, linear programs uh, by the simplex method. And uh, of course, as you all know, what the simplex method does is it pivots uh, from vertex to, uh, to vertex starting from uh, somehow an unfeasible solution uh, until you can no longer make any improvements uh, and then you get to uh, obviously the, the optimal solution. Um, so uh, there, uh, this, this problem obviously has a very uh, long history and here is a very shortened uh, version of it. Um, so I mean the method was uh, invented by uh, Danzig in, 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 in 4047 it soon became like a work for a workhorse for solving uh, sort of uh, military logistics problems, actually. Um, and uh, I guess at this point they were mostly sort of computing things by hand, which is impressive. Um, and uh, then you know basic questions uh, started to come up, such as um, how you know large can the distance be between any two uh, vertices on the polytope? So that was uh, the Hirsch conjecture, uh, which uh, in 2010 was actually uh, disproven. Uh, so this is not a, a correct bound for uh, any polytope, but we don't even know if it's uh, more than two times this. Um, and uh, of course, uh, sort of there are many pivot rules, and uh, all of them are bad in the worst case, uh, as far as we know. Uh, and um, the first, you know, uh, Example uh, were these, you know, Clement cubes, which uh, are special cases of deformed products, uh, which were, you know, used to beat sort of almost all the classical uh, pivot rules, and then more complicated constructions came in for uh, randomized pivot rules uh, recently, a few years ago. Um, and now, a work that sort of really motivated. Uh, uh, or, or, I mean, was, was really, uh, I guess, revolutionary, uh, was, was due to uh, Borg War, um, which, I mean, somehow it's not as well known as it, as it should be. Um, and he gave some of the, uh, I guess, m more impressive uh, average case results. So showing that if you can't do anything in the worst case, can you at least do something in the average case? Um, and he got essentially nearly tight bounds for, for uh, relatively natural classes of, of, of uh, random instances. Um, and uh, uh, you know, some more progress. We had uh, improvements on uh, you know the worst case diameter bounds, like uh, colliding Kleitman, which uh, gave uh, quasi polynomial bounds. We had sub exponential pivot rules. Um, but you know, still, that's very far from what you would like to see, um, you know, in, in, for worst case or for things that are practically meaningful. Um, and then in 2004, Spielman and Tang came up with the notion of, of smooth analysis, which we'll uh, get into, and wrote a 90-page paper uh, that uh, explained how you can implement a simplex method, which has polynomial complexity when uh, the input is randomly perturbed. Um, so uh, let's get to the simplex rule that is essentially the only, roughly the only one we can analyze uh, in, in um, you know, in generality um, for uh, for uh, as a simplex pivot rule. So this is the shadow vertex rule, um, and. The way of, of thinking about it is uh, you somehow, you know, you start from a known vertex. So it's always a problem to get a known, you know, a starting vertex, but assume you have one. Um, and uh, you have um, a desired uh, objective that you would like to maximize. 
Um, and now you start with a, um, a C prime, which is optimized at your starting objective. And the pivot rule, what it does is morally it follows the sequence of optimizers you would get by interpolating from your um, initial objective, which maximizes uh, this vertex, um, all the way until you get to your uh, final, vertex, uh, final objective. And geometrically, this corresponds to uh, taking this polytope, projecting it onto the span of the two objectives that you have, the first one that's uh, maximized here, and the one you actually would like to compute an optimal for, and looking at the uh, projection of the polytope and following the boundary here. Okay, and it's, it's not completely like obvious how you implement this method, but, but you can do it, and these are really what the pivots look like. Um, so um, it doesn't seem necessarily like the most natural method in the world. Um, so why is this been like so popular, or maybe you know the, the only one we can really analyze in, in, in generality? And the reason is one of the few methods, or maybe the only method I really know, where you can sort of determine whether a vertex is going to be on the path uh, without like knowing the entire path. Okay, so you can locally determine whether a vertex is on the path because it should optimize one of uh, these objectives, and this you can check actually easily. Uh, and um, you know, if you're going to act, tell me, you know, is this vertex going to be on the path of you know the you know minimum reduced cost rule or something like this? This is very difficult to figure out. I, I think, in fact, there are complexity results that say it's very horrible to figure out. Um, so this is the reason, and it's also, I guess, to some extent, a stumbling block. So, um, yeah. Okay, so what, what was done from the perspective of uh, average case analysis? Um, uh, so quite a few things. Uh, so the first work that I mentioned uh, by, by Borgwart on this subject um, looked at this type of system where uh, the right-hand side is one, and the rows of A are sampled from any rotationally symmetric distribution. And uh, he actually um, essentially, well, not for the algorithm, but for relative, uh, uh, an important geometric quantity, which we'll get to later, basically proved tight bounds on the, uh, uh, the, the worst case uh, expected uh, size of a path. Um, and uh, there was, uh, more work where you also uh, 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 were allowed to um, have something different than one where the B was random. Uh, and here actually, I mean, this, these papers, even though they get like horrible bounds, actually looked at almost more general, I think, linear complementarity problems and were able to get bounds for those. Um, and something which I think people are more familiar with, uh, well, if at all, uh, is this line of work where they looked at uh, average case problems where essentially the data is, is fixed as long as it's somewhat generic uh, and you flip the constraints every uh, and then they prove pretty amazing amazing bounds uh, I mean except for the fact that you know if you have a lot of constraints and you start flipping them at random you know your problem is going to be infeasible quite quickly so sort of most of the the problems that they solve are uh, trivial in some sense, um, and you know even for the relevant cases, it, it's difficult to justify that flipping constraints at random is something that you would really see in practice. So, um, but it's I mean it was very interesting results and nice techniques. Um, okay, so uh, you know this motivated Sarnson. Spielman and Tang to uh, uh, try and, and push further. Uh, so here is supposed to be, you know, what you consider a, maybe a typical image to be, and here would be what a truly random image would be, and obviously they're not uh, correlated at all. Um, so you know, the idea, in some sense, of smooth analysis is to interpolate between these two uh, worlds. So you sort of start from the picture on the left, uh, and you allow yourself to add noise. Okay, random noise. Um, and you're going to parameterize uh, uh, the, the pro 
I guess the instances by how much noise you end up adding. Okay. Uh, so as you allow yourself to add more and more random noise, you get back to the completely average case. Right. So smooth analysis uh, is is really a way to sort of interpolate between worst case and average case analysis. And let's see it formally for how we would do it for LPs. Um, so you, you start with a system that's uh, normalized reasonably, and the reasonable normalization is uh, this is going to be sort of the expected matrix. This is like your ideal uh, problem that you're starting from. And here you ask that uh, the row norms of the combined AB should have size 1. Okay? So when you're adding noise, it's like you're, you're adding noise that's like proportional uh, to the size of the problem in some sense. Um, and then you just add Gaussian noise, or at least that, that was the model they, uh, they had of uh, some uh, standard deviation sigma, this should be sigma squared. Um, and the problem that you want to solve is the perturb problem. Notice that you don't have to um, perturb the objective here. Um, and, and the goal in smooth analysis what, uh, it, or you're going to say that the problem has expected uh, or a smooth polynomial complexity if the expected time of the algorithm on uh, a smooth uh, instance like this is polynomial um, in you know the design dimensions uh, as well as uh, one over sigma. Okay, so you allow polynomial dependence in one over sigma, which is how you are allowed to escape sort of some of these worst case uh, results. Um, so, any any questions about the basic definition of, of polynomial smooth complexity? Sometimes there are condition numbers on the matrix. So are they related? I mean, I mean. I mean so, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so here, uh, I, I, I mean, so Spion Tang analyzed analyzed this. That I guess once you normalize the matrix and you add noise like this, it does become well conditioned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it, sort of irrespective of how, I guess, ill-conditioned it was before, if you add enough random noise, the matrix becomes somewhat well-conditioned. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, right, so here are the, the kind of smooth complexity bounds that, that uh, uh, or I mean, not all of them, but uh, that, that we had in, in, in the literature. Uh, and you know, Morley, you know, the, they were the first ones to come up with uh, a smooth complexity analysis. So it was very complicated, and uh, you know, had a horrible complexity. Uh, um, and things got a lot simplified with Grushinin's work, uh, and we do even better. Um, so there's a lot, you know, that goes into these results. So let's unpack. Uh, the sort of geometric aspects, and then if I have time, I'll go into the algorithmic aspects. Uh, so the most important thing, the most important geometric estimate, which you reduce everything to, uh, is the following. So now you, you start with a normalized matrix again, uh, but the right-hand sides are now one. Okay, and uh, you smooth. Uh, the, the matrix A, so you add the Gaussian noise of uh, desired standard deviation, and we're going to fix uh, a projection plane, uh, which is going to correspond to uh, what, what would the stand of the two objectives that you would use. Um, and you want to compute the expected number of edges or vertices uh, that this projected polytope uh, will have on this plane. So the plane is fixed, so the randomness of the poly of the A in A does not affect W. This is uh, crucial because otherwise uh, it's, it becomes much more difficult to analyze. Uh, and the goal is to bound this expected size of the shadow, so the number of vertices in this projection. Um, so uh, the, yeah, but how is the that fixed two D plane? Like for example, if it is just the France two coordinates. Yes, it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't matter. Uh, I mean, you could rotate things. Uh, so it's a word. It, it, it's so once k is over a, yeah. Yeah. So it's right. You're going to get a bound that's uh, yeah, it, that, yeah. That somehow yeah. it's going to be independent of yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, everything. Yeah. Just on, on dimension and, and number of uh, 
constraints uh, and uh, the size of the perturbations. Um, good, so, so yeah, these are the bounds uh, that, that we get. So basically we approve uh, the best known by factor D, we approve the dependence on sigma, um, yeah, the dependence on the number of constraints uh, is surprisingly small, so it's uh, only a uh, polylogarithmic. Um, so, yeah, we basically improve the parameter range uh, in every possible way. Uh, and I, it's nice to compare to uh, Borgwars' bound, which corresponds to the case where the like matrix you're perturbing is the zero matrix. Uh, so you can imagine that you know the only thing that's there is Gaussian noise. Um, and there he got, uh, in fact, a, a tight bound. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're not super far off, at least if you look at the terms that don't depend on sigma. Um, so we're getting there. Uh, but I think the dependence on sigma is probably completely off. Um, okay. So let's talk about how you get at the. Uh, so, yeah. The simplex is run on the on the primer by adding because we add equalities, right? I mean. No, no. So, so simplex. Uh, oh, so we, 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 like this is just a geometric estimate which we will use to bound uh, the uh, behavior of a simplex algorithm mm. uh, that will be a shadow simplex algorithm. Um, but it's not obvious uh, how to. It's not immediately obvious how to do it. Uh, I mean, especially, and we'll talk about this hopefully at the end, I mean, one of the main issues is that um, you need to have the plane that you pivot on to be sort of independent of the data. And, you know, to run the shadow simplex method, you know, technically you need an initial starting vertex. It's difficult to believe, you know, how, would you, how are you going to get an initial starting vertex and an objective maximizing it which somehow doesn't depend on the data? Uh, so, so you have to be careful in the reduction. And this caused people lots of pain, uh, but it, it's actually easy to fix. Uh, okay, so uh, how do we, let, let me talk now about how we get at the geometric estimate and some of the, the high level ideas uh, there. Um, so the first thing is to sort of transform the problem. Uh, uh, so you you basically you know use some basic duality to show that the number of uh, vertices that, that you see here is always going to be smaller than the number of edges you have in the picture where uh, you basically take the polar so you look at the convex hull of the constraints um, and you look at how the plane intersects the convex hull of the con constraints so if you look at a simplex here, this is uh, actually going to correspond to a vertex of the original uh, polytope. Uh, and it's going to give you sort of all of the objectives that maximize uh, uh, the vertex that's tight at these three constraints. Uh, and uh, the corner points are exactly the edges. Um, so where you intersect this 2D plane is sort of representing all of the uh, vertices that optimize one of the directions uh, on this plane. Okay, so that, that's the thing we want to that. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, so we're trying to count uh, the edges of a two-dimensional object, and surprisingly, there are many painful ways to do this, uh, but uh, uh, Kellner and Spielman came up with uh, like an incontrovertibly simple logic um, which uh, makes life very, uh, much easier. Uh, so, I mean, the, the basic uh, fact is, uh, you know, if you want to know how many edges there are, you can obviously upper bound this by the perimeter of the object divided by the shortest edge length, edge length right? Uh, so here's the shortest edge length, here's the perimeter. Uh, it's easy to get a bound this way. The uh, thing that we will want to do, and that's not hard to do, and I'll show you, is that we want to do something like this. Okay, so we want to uh, take expectations, uh, and we want to look at sort of the minimum expected edge length, but even though this is not particularly well defined uh, the way I, I wrote it here. So let's make this formal. Um, so all the edges, what they can come from are, you know, sort of, these uh, 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 facets of the, the convex hull. Uh, so there are, you know, if you have D, um, if you have N facets, you have sort of N to the D uh, uh, possibilities for these simplices. 
and each of them could potentially uh, contribute an edge. So we're just going to have different events for every possible uh, subset of sides D, uh, and look at what we get when we compare both sides. So the expected parameter of this convex hull is exactly you know, the expected uh, length uh, of, uh, of an edge uh, conditioned on that simplex uh, uh, forming an edge times the probability that it forms an edge. Okay, so this is just linearity of expectation. Um, and so now we can just take the minimum edge length out. So this is the, the minimum length that this uh, simplex will, uh, the, min the minimum uh, length of an edge that the, sorry, the expected length of the edge that this simplex will induce conditioned on it actually uh, uh, forming an edge of uh, this uh, object here. Uh, so you take it out, um, you get the minimum that, that, that comes out here, and here all you have is sort of the probability that each one of these guys contributes an edge. Um, and again, by linearity of expectations, this, this part is just the expected number of edges. Right? And now you uh, um, rearrange and you get like a very simple inequality. Um, and our goal will now basically just be to uh, bound the expected perimeter and lower bound the expect minimum expected edge. Okay? Good. Um, so how do you deal with the perimeter? This is uh, really simple. Um, so all of these guys, again, are uh, you know, randomly perturbed uh, vectors. Uh, and the center of these, um, the expected vector has norm one. Okay, so these are uh, short vectors on expectation. Um, and the perturbations are also small. Okay, so, so using that, we will get a very simple uh, bound on the perimeter, which is basically that if you take the polygon uh, that they induce, you can um, bound the perimeter of uh, this polygon just by the perimeter of the minimum containing uh, circle. Uh, and this is a, uh, a basic fact about uh, convex sets that sort of perimeter is monotonic. Um, so the expected perimeter is at most 2 pi times the sort of radius of the containing circle. Um, how big is the radius of the containing circle? Well, this object is, uh, the, the intersection of Q and W is smaller than the sort of projection of Q onto W. Uh, and the projection of Q onto W, you know it's vertices. It's just the projections of the vertices upstairs. So all you have to do is bound the norm of the projections of the vertices upstairs, but you have to bound the maximum. And so you have, like, essentially um, the maximum of n Gaussians, roughly speaking, of standard deviation sigma, and they're shifted by 1. Okay, so that's, uh, this is a standard, uh, like, one-line computation. Um, so, so the perimeter is basically logarith or, you know, polylogarithmic, uh, in, in the number of constraints and uh, has a you know, linear dependence on sigma. Okay, and if sigma is small, in fact, it's just one. Right? The upper bound is one. Okay, so that was that bound. Um, so the much harder estimate, which I'm, most, I'm just going to give you a very vague sense of uh, what we do, uh, is how you bound uh, the minimum edge length. Right? So you condition on uh, uh, one of these guys uh, intersecting the plane and forming a facet, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you want to know uh, how big this edge length ends up being. Um, so we break this up into, into like two pieces. So we essentially condition on you know, this simplex forming a facet. Uh, and we sort of fix almost everything you can imagine. So we sort of condition on uh, the plane that these guys land on. Um, once you condition on the plane that these guys land on, we'll actually look at where they, um, uh, so, so once we condition on this plane, uh, the W is only going to intersect this plane in, in, a, in a one line segment. Um, and 
what we're going to do is we're going to basically uh, condition on uh, the, the shape of this, um, uh, of this triangle or, or simplex um, with respect to uh, what it looks like when you project orthogonal to this line. And so now uh, we're going to look at the two, I mean, two quantities. So we're interested in the length of this segment. So instead of computing the length of this segment directly, we're going to compute it in two steps. So first we'll look at uh, the longest uh, line segment as it, that is parallel to L as it intersects this simplex. And it turns out that um, the, if, if, if I condition on how um, this simplex looks when I project orthogonal to L, this length only depends on um, where these where these guys land on their respective lines. Okay, so they're going to uh, you're going to look at where they land on their their respective lines, and this is going to control the longest edge length. I mean, the longest uh, chord here. Uh, and it turns out that all we need is a lower bound on sort of the variance of these AIs when you restrict them to the lines parallel to L. Um, which for Gaussians is very simple. You restrict Gaussians to lines, you get one-dimensional Gaussians back. So that's a, a, a very simple estimate. Um, and then uh, we look at um, the sort of fraction, uh, I mean, the ratio between the, line, the, the length of this line segment and the length of the longest one. And this, you can sort of think of like taking this guy and using the randomness to like shake the simplex around. Okay, and when you shake the simplex around, you're sort of hopefully unlikely to end up near the corners. And the closer you are to the center, which is roughly this point, the larger this ratio is going to be. So you basically use that logic to try and show that this ratio is, is, is not too small. Um, and the length of this guy is basically just going to be the product of the two terms. Um, and here, what we've actually ended up doing is we parameterized uh, the main properties we need of the error distributions um, that sort of abstract out the Gaussian. Um, so at the end, we get a, a sort of parameterized uh, bound on, on the size of the shadow, which depends on these four properties. And mostly what they're saying is that uh, you, the first two are basically saying you should have, um, no, actually, it's not the first two. So capital R and little r are basically saying that your error distributions should have good tails, like good tail bounds. Uh, and the intermediate uh, two are basically saying you don't want your uh, distribution to be too concentrated either. OK, so you want it to be somewhat Lipschitz. Uh, and so when you put it all together, you actually get like a very beautiful looking formula uh, uh, that I think has a very clean you know, analysis. And I'm hopeful that you know, maybe people can improve on this and use it to uh, uh, generalize this to more interesting distributions. Uh, I mean, the issue is these, these actually impose quite a few constraints on your distribution uh, that, that sort of limits the, the range of interesting things it can deal with. They can't deal with like, finite um, so, uh, distributions whose, where the errors are a finite size. Um, OK. Good, so I have a few more uh, minutes left. So I want to say something about how you use this bounds algorithmically. Uh, because now, uh, I mean, yeah, we haven't said anything about algorithms, right? So we're going to be interested in things where the right-hand sides are apparently you know, not one. Uh, you know, uh, this is talking about uh, the total number of vertices on a, on a projection plane, but to run the shadow simplex method, you need to start with one of those vertices to begin pivoting. So where do you get that from? Um, so those are all the questions you have to answer. So first, what we'll do is our, we'll have a two-phase method. So this is not really, uh, I'm, I'm, this is not really our work, but our combination uh, is simpler than what, what has been uh, done before, and I think it's, it's useful to know. Uh, so the first thing is 
we'll want to solve as our, as our phase one the problem where we forget about what the original right hand side is and we replace it with one. Okay. Um, so so this will be sort of our phase one. Um, now the nice thing about this phase one is that uh, we already know like a feasible solution, i.e. zero. Okay, so feasibility is not the issue. Um, and uh, the, the question is how do you, um, you know, again, use the simplex method or shadow simplex method to solve this problem. So it turns out Borgward already figured this out in the 80s and uh, people forgot this, um, which is that you just solve the problem by sort of setting all the variables uh, 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 to zero except for one, and then you will iteratively use the solution in the previous step to solve uh, the next problem. So okay, if there's only one variable, everyone here can solve it. Uh, probably also two variables. Um, but I mean, the most Im important observation is that um, the optimal solution you find at one stage actually lies on a fixed shadow plane in the next stage. Uh, and in particular, if you solve the problem for uh, k plus k variables, uh, for k plus one variables, your solution is actually generically on an edge of the shadow for this uh, shadow plane. It's basically the first k coordinates of the objective plus uh, the k plus one uh, unit vector. And um, the important thing is that this plane is fixed. So it doesn't depend at all on the data. Uh, so for each stage of this, you can bound the performance of the algorithm using the generic estimate, because you're just going to be pivoting along this plane. So you're going to see at least, at most, the shadow bound number of vertices, uh, and it all fits the model, right? It also, if I delete constraints of uh, columns of A, it still like fits the model. Um, okay, so that's phase one. Um, and how do you do uh, phase two? So you sort of assume that you've solved this problem, you have the optimal solution here, uh, and now you're going to just interpolate the right-hand side. So you're going to interpolate from one, the right-hand side being one, to the right-hand side being b, okay, by adding an extra variable. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so it, it turns out that your phase one has basically solved this problem where you've uh, negatively penalize uh, the interpolation variable, so it uh, wants to be at uh, lambda equals zero, in which case uh, you're, this is the phase one problem. And then you increase the weight to positive infinity until you get a solution to the phase two problem. And this is another, uh, uh, this is also of the sort of almost correct type uh, for applying the shadow map. Um, everything is perturbed. Uh, the only thing that isn't perturbed is, is this constraint right here, but it turns out that it only adds like two edges. Okay, so that's it. Uh, so natural open questions. Um, you want to improve uh, on our estimates. Uh, I think it's definitely possible. Uh, maybe, you know, just as interesting as to generalize which kinds of noise distributions uh, this can work for. Uh, and uh, another thing that I find very interesting, which comes up in the, in the context of uh, solving uh, IPs. Uh, when you're solving IPs by a, a branch and bound, you're solving actually sequences of very related LPs. Um, and there's no analysis at all for solving sequences of LPs using the simplex method. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Questions? So can you expand it all on uh, sparse noise? Because you know, in practice, LPs are sparse. So but here you're creating everything on zero. So can you do something where you keep a lot of zeros? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, you can't. Uh, I mean, if you directly restrict to the support of, of, of the matrix, I, I believe the answer is no. Uh, but it would be interesting to know like, if you, you know, allow yourself to perturb a little bit more. What you can, uh, what you can get. Okay, thank you.